say that it is having number of views and downloads about 4,000, 5,000, etc. from different parts of India. So the credit goes to the state president, Dr. Jose O, and the man behind the show, Dr. Sankar Vies, and also the editorial board of the scientific committee of PG Tips. So with these words, I invite uh, our respected president, Dr. Jose O, sir, for the presidential address. Thank you, Dr. Krishnan Mogan. Good evening to all. Most respected teacher of teacher and the central, past general IP president, Dr. Piyush Gupta, sir. Today, expect in the today program, Dr. Professor Mumugan, sir. Professor Mohan, sir. IEP Kerala vice president, Dr. Sangar. And today, the going to present Dr. Adarsh, Dr. Vaishnavi, and Sis Sarsara, Dr. Ranjit, and all the senior faculties and my dear students. I think it is an auspicious day for IAP Kerala is concerned when I started out my action plan Synergy 2023. The PG teaching program was my main dream to implement IAP Kerala Action Man 2023. So that is why the initiation and the great support from none other than Professor Chanavas sir, even all the guidance for the Dr. Shankar and Chanavas sir, the main man behind the concept of PG tips programs. So we are every weeks we are going to they already release uh, PG tips in a Zoom platform and and but we uploaded our website by our editor of the website, Dr. Pravin K has done a beautiful website design and uploaded on the site. And it was very much appreciated by IAPNs of the Kerala and outside Kerala and outside India also. There was a good response regarding the our PG this programs. What was the aim of this program was to give the support for our PG students and difficult topic in PG theory examinations. We know that BMB theory and PG theory, MD theory are now the difficult, and some of the questions are a difficult question for that. And we've chosen the topic in such a way that they, they get the guidance to prepare their theory examinations. And regarding the PG tips, we are planning to finish by 52 editions in the this year. And once you finish our IAP action 2023, we are going to publish as a textbook of reference for PG teaching as a volume one. And this pharma is give, uh, willing to uh, given the willingness to prepare and edit, uh, publish the book in the uh, free of cost for the, all the Kerala IAPNs. I think that will be the one of the important topics is a re response by the all the IAPNs and even the uh, PG teachers are given the positive response. It was very useful for their and uh, PGs for preparing the theory examinations. Regarding the PG, our action plan Synergy 2023, another important action and uh, uh, ECD uh, early child development program was the, one of the pioneer action plans of our president, Dr. P. H. Gupta, sir. And based on that program, IEP Kerala also prepared the uh, uh, so software application for development of for all the uh, APNs and family uh, parents regarding the development issues concerned. Based on the MCP card, IAP Kerala has prepared a uh, development app that is app was uploaded in the Play Store that can be freely downloaded, that can be useful for the pediatricians to motivate the parents regarding the early identification of development issues. And that is prepared by none other than Dr. Peter Valail from the uh, additional professor of Government Medical Court uh, Ernaulam has uh, prepared another two uh, software applications and uh, asthma dairy app and IAP growth app also prepared by the Peter Valil. That three software applications are the Im another important uh, action flashy program for IAP Kerala is concerned that it was uploaded in the software uh, play stores and anybody can download it and use for the both asthma monitoring, growth the monitoring, and again, the development of monitoring is very three software applications are there. Along with this software application, another important program we are going, IAP Kerala is conducting regularly Every Thursday under the leadership of Dr. Shanavas, we are conducting regular PG clinical club. 
by uh, different um, branches of iap kerala we are regularly conducting and along with that this year we are prepared three module <clears throat> one is uh, dermatology module for general practitioners and iapians and for essential newborn care module for the uh, those who are practicing the newborn care and again the uh, we are prepared that an, uh, uh, sexual education module by the adults and health academy and these are three important module also we prepared and we are is cha charted out and we are implemented the program in all over the kerala's and i think uh, we are we are honored by the presence of our central uh, ip present professor piyush gupta sir i think he, he, this is a great honor for iap kerala in uh, the presence of your sir for inaugurating our releasing of 25th issue of the pg tips uh, for the general pg students is concerned with this wish i wish you this program all the best and jai hind jai ap thank you dr sir now it's time to invite uh, the ma main person behind uh, pg tips dr shankar vh he is the scientific committee chair and the state coordinator of pg tips and in his team we have a, a full scientific committee including dr mohandas nayar dr mary james dr pramila joji dr priya shrinivasan dr satyajit and dr suresh kumar ek i take this opportunity to congratulate shankar sir as well as the whole editorial as well as the scientific committee for uh, bringing out each and every issue of pg tips very well so with these words i invite uh, our dear state vice president dr shankar vh to say a few words about pg tips as well as to introduce and welcome our chief guest of today dr piyush gupta sir over to you shankar sir uh, good evening all respected piyush gupta sir uh, past iap national president dr jos president iap kerala Dr. Krishna Mohan, Dr. Ranjit, other OB members, and other senior faculty and PG students. So today I am really happy that in last September or August, August or September, when Joe told, and uh, myself, Joe's and Shanavas was the preliminary introduction. Followed by we had a Zoom meeting, various Zoom meeting, how to uh, go about this PG tips because what we thought the theory examination there are so many questions. which they may not get directly from the nelsons or standard textbooks so we will identify the topics then first we have identified the topics what should be the formatting and all those things has been discussed and as like krishna mohan rightly pointed out when we started in the january always we had a doubt whether we will be able to complete it or every week we will be able to do it but now we are in the halfway uh, through the first year and around 25 issues this is today is the 25th issue and uh, after the next week it is the uh, 26 half of the year is over and already we have completed all 26 issues and all issues has been uploaded in the website and from the pravin ks i understood that a lot of hits are coming in this pg tips and so many downloads are happening as a teacher i am very happy to uh, share my happiness that we were able to do justice to our students that they were help getting helps in the uh, examination and in this juncture i am also thanking all my co scientific committee that is already the name krishna mohan has told from mohan das nayar to everybody all people they are helped me and all ob members like krishna mohan ranjit jos or uh, 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 dr shimmi dr vijay kumar and all eb member ob members and as well as all faculty and reviewers because we have had one faculty is there who will write it and one reviewer also is there i am not going to tell all numbers that we will do in the year end we will tell when we are raising the book we will tell the all reviewers and uh, faculty and uh, already we are uh, going ahead with the next uh, 26 topics for the next year i have next uh, six months already is going on some are in the already finished uh, four or five already is ready for publication we will do it every week and some are in the reviewer stage some are in the formatting stage and some are already in the ordering stage so already around 26 to 30 already under preparation so this year definitely we may not have any problem to complete it and if possible i think we will be able to continue next year also because already around 100 topics are already decided to do it in the uh, things uh, are in the pipeline so with this much introduction i want to i am second my most important happiness is we got piyush gupta sir today and he is the as everybody knows he is the greatest one of the greatest academician we can see in the pediatrics arena this uh, now in the uh, india 
So I don't think any introduction he needs, but just for a, a, a purpose, I'm just introducing him. Sir is a renowned academician, teacher, researcher, author, editor with three decades experience in child health and uh, care and medical education research and publishing. Now, sir is the professor of pediatrics and head of pediatrics at University College of Medical Sciences. All of us know him as the editor of Indian Pediatrics for from 2008 to 2013. He has done a wonderful job and he has edited other 38 textbooks and published more than 200 papers and reputed indexed uh, journal. He is having a lot of laurels for him and I know him personally with him because I have written one paper on Down syndrome and he got the chance to write a, a Down syndrome paper in Journal of Pediatrics, 50 years. So, sir has interested me. So, I have seen him. I have written that article and I have sent him. Within 10 minutes, I got the reply. This, this is correction is there. So, he's a wonderful editor, wonderful teacher, wonderful mentor. But I was not able to get a chance to work with him. But I have worked with him in so many papers. And two textbooks I have written chapters on his two textbooks. And now again, we are working in the one of the CD module because one CD we are going to uh, write in this also genetics. Uh, Sar is the editor. So I have got a lot of chance to work with him, not as a student, as a co-writer and as thing, but he's a great mentor and teacher. I'm very happy that today we got uh, Sar for this uh, issue of 25th issue. I am welcoming Sar for this August audience and uh, for his inaugural speech, as well as when he told it is done, Praveen KS will uh, issue, issue will be released. Over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, my very dear uh, Dr. Sankar. And uh, first of all, I would uh, like to pay my gratitude to IIP Kerala, the president, my very, very dear uh, Dr. Joe's, Secretary, dear Dr. Krishna Mohan, and all the experts, especially the expert for today, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kunju, and all my dear friends. I, I, I want to take name of each and every one, but that will take, take half an hour because Kerala was the state where I think I have traveled most uh, when I was doing the presidential campaigning. And I know more members of Kerala than members of any other state in India. So I am really overwhelmed and it was a really a privilege, a proud privilege when Dr. Joe's invited me to be there. I would have loved to be there physically, but today I am in one of the other medical colleges for NMC inspection that was long due. So that's why I'm joining from my phone. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me and giving me this honor. Now, uh, this is, uh, I've gone through some issues of PG tips, which Dr. Joe's sent. And Dr. Sankar, I must say you have done a fantastic job. Your team is uh, excellent uh, editing and excellent typesetting. And it's so pleasing to uh, see all those, uh, all those editions that you have produced till now. And I can't wait to read the further editions. So I'm happy that we are today in the 25th edition. And when you, uh, when you were telling the story, how this came out, I was reminded of my story of when I conceived the parental guidelines. So this is same, you dream and you never know that it is going to be true. And once it is there, you really are, you, you really yearn for more. And uh, it is, it is good that when uh, there are so many hits on the website, so many downloads, so many PG reading that I think that is the best compliment and best reward anybody can get. It cannot be measured in terms of any name, fame, or money. It is just that people are using what you have created. And I think hats off to you, hats off to Joe's, uh, Secretary Krishna Mohan, and all the OB, EB members, faculty members of uh, Kerala IAP, and all the members of uh, Kerala IAP. My blessings to all the postgraduate students who are using this. I'm sure it will be a great uh, help in their casket. And thank you, Joe's. And once again, congratulations for your. Many laurels. I think you are doing a wonderful innings as a president. Uh, you have done an ECD app. I am so happy about it. I would love to see it. Please share it with me. That was one. But I think it should go all India. So once you have successfully done it in Kerala, I think we can do the same for the other states as well. Uh, so thank you once again for giving me this opportunity, being here with you and with Pranam Namaskaram to all of you. Uh, I uh, inaugurate 
this 25th uh, session or edition of PG Tips. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Praveen, for releasing it. That will be sent to the WhatsApp also. So along with this today's program, even though it is a, our a happy celebration, we thought uh, Josh has all this program is planned by Josh only. Josh is the uh, person who is planned all those things. So Josh has told me to have two presentations. So what we have done is uh, one presentation, one hour will be a posing. So today, issue, that is laboratory diagnosis of muscle disorder, will be presented by the author of that group, one of the author of the group, and uh, 25 minutes to my 30 minutes maximum, followed by next issue also will be released. Next issue is uh, not released, sorry. Next issue is actually advanced genetic testing, microarray, and NGS in clinical practice, because that's a very common short notes asked for the uh, PGs, microarray and NGS. So one of our PG, I was, I was the author for that along with the PG and Mohandas is the reviewer. Uh, for laboratory diagnosis, it is uh, from the uh, Vaishnavi will be presenting and Jaram Shankar also is there and uh, uh, Omar Kunjusar is the expert uh, person. So first will be one presentation followed by the uh, genetic testing presentation. Experts will be commenting on answer for that. So I think we can go to the presentation. So first Vaishnavi, you can to your presentation on today's topic, laboratory diagnosis of muscle disorder. Sir, is the screen visible? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes, yes. So good evening all. Today's presentation is on lab investigations in childhood myopathy. So coming to an introduction, neuromuscular disorders are diseases that impair the function of skeletal muscles. It constitutes a significant proportion of pediatric neurological disease. And neuromuscular disorders are classified based on the neuroanatomical site of lesion into anterior horn cell disease, neuropathy, neuromus disorders of neuromuscular junction, and myopathy. So myopathy can be congenital, familial, or acquired muscle disease unrelated to any disorder of innovation or neuromuscular junction. Can, can you make it uh, full screen? Uh, initially it was full screen, but now it is not. Sure, sir. Okay. Okay, okay. now it's okay. Okay, sir. So myopathy can be congenital, familial, or acquired muscle disease unrelated to any disorder of innovation or neuromuscular junction. It clinically manifests with symmetrical hypotonia, proximal muscle weakness, malaise, fatigue, and with normal consciousness and no sensory symptoms. The deep tendon reflexes may be sluggish, atrophy of muscle is a late finding, and dysmorphism and other system involvement like eyes, skin, or heart may be present. Coming to a diagnosis, there can be significant clinical overlap between myopathies and other neuromuscular disorders, and hence it may not be possible to distinguish between different types of myopathies. So this is an algorithm for suspected muscle disorders based on the clinical pattern. So it can be divided into constant or progressive weakness and fluctuating weakness. When it is a fluctuating weakness, it can be myasthenia gravis, metabolic disorders, or periodic paralysis. And when it is a constant or progressive weakness, it can be divided into inflammatory and progressive weakness. When it is an inflammatory condition, it can be dermatomyositis or polymyositis. And progressive conditions can be divided based on the uh, muscle of involvement into ocular, facial, and conditions involving the upper limbs and lower limbs. Myopathies involving ocular, uh, ocular muscles include kiern sayer syndrome, ocular pharyngeal dystrophy, ocular dystrophy. Facial muscles include facio-scapulohumeral facio dystrophy and muscular dystrophy. Involving the upper limbs include Emery Rufus muscular dystrophy and hereditary distal myopathy. 
Involving the lower limbs include Duchenne muscular dystrophy, Becker muscular dystrophy, limb girdle muscle dystrophy, and juvenile SMA. So coming to the preliminary investigations. The preliminary investigations, including routine hematological and biochemical investigations, can give a clue to a diagnosis. A presence of a raised ESR and CRP with, a, with an elevated total leukocyte count might indicate a dermatomyositis. Electrolyte abnormalities like hypokalemia and hyperkalemia are associated with periodic paralysis. And uh, additionally, serum calcium, magnesium levels, serum TSH, and free T4 levels are also assessed. A raised serum creatinine phosphokinase, urine myoglobinuria, hyperkalemia, raised alveolase, lactate dehydrogenase, and aspartate amnotransferase could indicate rhabdomyolysis or simply muscular dystrophy. So coming to specific investigations, forearm ischemic test. This is done in children with suspected metabolic myopathy. In this, a baseline arterial lactate and blood ammonia are obtained, and the sphygmomanometer manometer is applied on the arm, and pressure raised just above the systolic blood pressure. The patient is asked to exercise with hands repeatedly for a minimum of one minute or till maximum fatigue. Following this, the cuff, cuff is deflated, and blood samples for lactate and ammonia are obtained at one minute, three minutes, six minutes, and ten minutes. In normal healthy patient and in children with a lipid storage disorder, the lactate levels will increase initially in the first two readings, followed by a decline. In children with McCardell's disease, this normal rise in lactate is absent. The normal rise in lactate with no rise in ammonia suggests a myoadenylate deaminase deficiency. Next investigation is creatine phosphokinase level. It is the most common first-line screening investigation in neuromuscular weakness. The muscle pain or weakness associated with CPK level more than 10 times the upper limit of normal, it is suggestive of myopathy. And CPK level is elevated in inflammatory muscle diseases like dermatomyositis, polymyositis, and active primary muscle diseases like Duchenne, uh, Becker's, and limb girdle muscle dystrophy. Moderate elevation of CPK is seen in facial scapulohumeral dystrophy, amyloidrophous muscle dystrophy, and congenital myopathy. And CPK MM and CPK MB can be raised in myopathy, but CPK MM is muscle specific and CPK MB is cardiac specific. And CPK levels may be increased following trauma and electromyography study also. CPK levels may pseudo normalize in end stages of most of the dystrophinopathies and or, and or if the child is on steroids. Coming next to the molecular diagnostic testing in brief. Molecular testing has become the first line investigation among those suspected with DMD gene deletion, SMA, that is SMN1 gene deletion, calpinopathy, calpin 3 western bloating, congenital myotonic dystrophy, that is DMPK gene defect, or myotubular myopathy, that is MTM1 gene defect. Gene panels and exome sequencing are increasingly being used as it is less invasive compared to muscle biopsy. Genetic testing is done in the following circumstances. That is to exclude alternate diagnosis like SMA0 and DM1. In conditions where muscle biopsy may not be helpful like selenoprotein 1 and lamin AOC related myopathy. In severely ill neonates with possible congenital myopathy to consider withdrawing supports. Another test is nerve conduction study. It also includes needle electromyography. It is used as neurophysiological examination is difficult to apply in young and uncooperative children. The study is used in differentiating the site of lesion, that is whether the lesion is in the nerve, muscle, or neuromuscular junction, and for diagnosing myotonia. Repetitive nerve stimulation tests can be performed to look for evidence of myasthenia. Coming to needle EMG, it will assess the muscle spontaneous activity, response to insertion of frog, characterization of motor unit action potential, and rapidity with which additional motor units are recruited in response to an electrical signal. An EMG showing uh, evidence of brief duration, small amplitude motor unit with increased recruitment is suggestive of myopathy. Reduced nerve conduction velocity is seen in patients with the primary muscle disorders, like a congenital muscular dystrophy with neurosin deficiency. So coming to the ne next investigation, that is muscle and nerve biopsy. It is essential for the final diagnosis of majority of neuromuscular diseases in children, unclassified by genetic testing. The muscle biopsy is ideally obtained from vastus lateralis or deltoid, and gastrocnemius muscle is avoided as tendon insertion extends through the muscle and may result in inadvertent sampling of tendon, which results in a difficulty in interpretation. So features in muscle biopsy, which is suggestive of some neuromuscular disorders include muscle fiber necrosis with regenerative changes and replacement with fat, which is seen in dystrophies, red fibers with oxidative enzyme study positive seen in mitochondrial myopathies, 
inflammatory changes with mononuclear infiltrates seen in dermatomyositis and glycogen accumulation with PA staining positive seen in glycogen storage disorders. The biopsy can be punch biopsy or open biopsy. Open biopsy samples are always preferred. And muscle biopsy, including immunohistochemical staining, is useful in characterization of muscular disorders, as mentioned earlier. And electron microscopy is also essential for characterization of congenital myopathies. USC and MRI of the muscle are used for localizing the best site of muscle biopsy. An MRI muscle with short to inversion recovery or stir sequence is especially useful in uh, inflammatory myopathies like dermatomyositis. Coming to the next investigation, that is skin biopsy. It is a simple and less traumatic procedure which requires minimal sedation and results in less traumatic scar and less chances of infection as compared to a muscle biopsy. And muscle biopsy being an invasive procedure and genetic facilities available in only a few centers, skin biopsy is now evolving as a diagnostic test that is easily available, simpler and less invasive, and it is more used. Skin biopsy can substitute for muscle biopsy as a preliminary diagnostic tool directing appropriate molecular testing and can be used for screening dystrophinopathy in a muscle dystrophy patient with a high sensitivity and positive predictive value. Histopathology and molecular ma markers of disease progression and response to novel treatment options can be assessed serially using skin biopsy. The next test is enzyme analysis. Metabolic myopathy requires enzymatic study for confirmation. This includes muscle phosphorylase deficiency, that is myocardial disease, and acid maltase deficiency, that is pompous disease. And tandem mass spectroscopy is required for the diagnosis of conditions like carnitine palmitoyl deficiency and, uh, and other uncommon men metabolic defects. Coming to the next test, that is antibody testing. It is used in children with suspected myasthenia gravis, where acetylcholine receptor antibody and antimask antibody can be used for diagnosis. Also, antimyositis antibody like anti jo one anti-MI2, anti-RO52 can be useful supportive investigation for the diagnosis of dermatomyositis. Next investigation is MRI brain. The CNS should be screened among children with smerosin deficient congenital muscular dystrophy and alpha dystroglycinopathies. And mus uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy is useful in mitochondrial myopathies. Coming to muscle ultrasound, muscle echogenicity can be assessed visually, semi quantitatively, or qualitatively by using uh, USG using grayscale analysis. In this, the pattern of echogenicity and specific muscle group involvement will point to a specific disease like inclusion body myositis, where there is a markedly increased echogenicity and atrophy of the affected muscle. And muscle ultrasound and MRI are used increasingly to characterize the severity and pattern of muscle involvement in inherited neuromuscular disorders. It has emerged as an important non-invasive adjunct to the diagnosis of neuromuscular disorders. The pattern of muscle atrophy, intramuscular fibrosis, and fatty infiltration can be detected using USG. And in addition, it can visualize the muscle movement, contractions, and fasciculations. The Duchenne muscular dystrophy is known to result in severe increase in inhomogeneous increase in muscle echo intensity with normal thickness, whereas SMA causes an inhomogeneous increase in muscle intensity with atrophy. Similarly, cal calpinopathy results in fatty infiltration and atrophy of the postromedial group of muscles. So these are my references. Thank you. Can you stop sharing slides? Yes, sir. Uh, could you, sir? Uh, 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 good evening and thank you. Uh, Sangar uh, Jos uh, for inviting me and uh, 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 for doing this uh, job also. I am happy that Dr. Vaishnavi has done an excellent uh, job and uh, she has done it in a precise uh, manner also. So uh, regarding the uh, topic, uh, pediatrics uh, as well as my postgraduates because earlier uh, uh, at least uh, uh, being Duchenne muscular dystrophy, a very uh, common disorder. May, you, sometimes it may be kept as a short case. So the PGs uh, may have to make a diagnosis of that. And uh, being the uh, SMA, being a fetable conditions, many times you will be getting a floppy baby as a uh, case again. So in these situations, you may have to differentiate uh, um, muscle diseases from uh, other conditions. 
and another situation where uh, again a postgraduate student will be encountering discussion on uh, muscle disorders will be when they get a case on uh, GBS because uh, especially in a, a subacute uh, presentation of uh, GBS where uh, the proximal muscle involvement is a major uh, uh, manifestation because uh, all of us know that uh, the muscle disorders are also having a proximal representation and both uh, may have only motor manifestation. So these are the situations where uh, you may be, uh, the postgraduates uh, will be encountering cases uh, of uh, uh, related to the muscle uh, disorders. And uh, for, uh, because even though these uh, tips are for postgraduates, because we all see that even when nowadays in a um, uh, CMEs, CMEs as well as in other uh, academic programs, the more uh, uh, the practitioners are attending than uh, postgraduates, because postgraduates, post they all feel that uh, they have access to uh, uh, net Google and uh, Google has become their uh, prime teacher. But uh, the consultants usually uh, have a, uh, more attention for this sort of a program. So definitely uh, these uh, uh, PG tips that is being organized by Dr. Joss and uh, uh, Dr. Shanavas um, uh, Shanger will be definitely be used by consultants. So we'll uh, just have a few points for the consultants also, because whenever uh, a child is uh, coming to you, uh, with a um, motor weakness, that will be the situation where you'll be suspecting a first and foremost a muscle disease. So uh, remember that in a muscle disease, you get uh, predominantly motor symptoms because sensory symptom per se will not be there in a pure motor uh, in a muscle disease. And uh, uh, only one condition where uh, sometimes they may have a motor uh, sensory manifestation would be a mitochondrial syndromes. But again, what I have seen is in our uh, DM training, whenever there is a peripheral nerve involvement with uh, uh, motor weakness, our uh, teachers used to make a diagnosis of mitochondrial uh, cytopathy was a differential diagnosis. But we know that uh, most of the mitochondrial syndromes are uh, defined. And so if you get a particular manifestations of a mitochondrial disorder, then you make that uh, syndrome rather than uh, just giving a, a blanket diagnosis of mitro mitochondrial cytopathy for any undiagnosable cases. So otherwise, so uh, first and foremost for a muscle disease would be to have only a muscle uh, manifestation. And that means pure motor manifestations. And second uh, would be that uh, the distribution of the weakness because majority, actually 99% of cases of a muscle disorder will be proximal involvement. That means proximal involvement either uh, having a difficulty in getting up from sitting position as well as raising the hand uh, above the shoulder. So these are the two situations, clinical and in young infants, because those children who are not uh, started walking, then uh, they will have a problem uh, again, pertaining to the proximal muscle weakness, where, uh, for example, a child who is having a proximal muscle uh, weakness will be uh, not able to able, uh, raise the hand up or uh, when they are uh, going to uh, suck, they will not be able to uh, 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 raise the hand. So in, instead of uh, using the finger, uh, the raising the hand to suck the fingers, they will turn the head and suck. So that means uh, you, by looking at that, you can understand that the baby is not able to uh, raise the hand like that. Similarly, uh, for a turning hour also, they may they may not be able to use the uh, uh, torso in a usual manner, especially when the axial muscles are affected. And when you keep the uh, uh, foot or a limb in a flexed position, especially in you know that because of the weakness of the proximal part, the child, the leg will. Uh, fall down. And uh, the, the one condition which has to be differentiated in a floppy baby would be, as, again, a pure muscular syndrome would be spinal muscular atrophy. So you have to differentiate uh, spinal muscular atrophy or anterior horizontal disease and muscle disease uh, in a young children. And, uh, and usually after the age of two years, uh, you know, be, uh, GBS also come into the picture. But as all of us know that the GBS will be having some amount of sensory manifest. That means sensory symptoms, at least, paresthesia, numbness will be there. 
And again, usually typical uh, uh, GBS, there will be additional uh, uh, bifacial palsy also will be there. Even though there are certain muscle disorders where you get a muscle involvement, uh, that is a facial involvement, uh, the GBS would be a DD of an acute uh, uh, muscle disease. And usual acute muscle disorders like uh, acute polymyositis or a dermatomyositis, facial muscles are respired. So that way, easily you can differentiate uh, uh, GBS, acute GBS from an acute uh, polymyositis or a dermatomyositis. So this way you know that there is a proximal muscle involvement. So you have, as I have mentioned in uh, young children, you may have difficulty in differentiating a, a spinal muscular atrophy from a uh, muscle disease. There, you know that uh, spinal muscular atrophy being an anterior horn cell disease will be having fasciculation. Some type of fasciculation you will get either uh, Tongue person, because already you have seen that there is proximal muscle weakness. As I have uh, told you, there is a difficulty raising the hand as well as the lifting the leg. In that case, you, you know that there is a possibility of fasciculation. Then you look at the tongue, tongue fibrillation. Many times when the children are crying, this fibrillation may be mis in mis in the normal movement itself will be misinterpreted as fibrillation. But in clinical practice, what I teach is that uh, when you see the typical weakness of a poly, um, spinal muscular atrophy, then you can use the tongue fasciculation as a corroborative finding rather than uh, just by seeing a fibrillation, you don't make a diagnosis of spinal muscular atrophy. And then uh, coming to the, if in a it's slightly older children, especially type 2 or type 3, you keep the hand in the outstretched position and you can see that there is a uh, fasciculatory tremor. This again, the tremor, unlike a usual tremor, which is a to and fro movement, that means in a fixed plane, this will be in multiple plane. So that is the difference between poly, poly mini myoclonus. So that way, clinically, we can differentiate. And one more point, being a lower motor neuron disorder, you will get a hyporeflexia in a muscle disease. But again, here, remember that because it is a uh, proximal muscle disease. In muscle diseases, knee jerk will be sluggish or absent, but angle jerk will be elicitable. Even till then, that is very much characteristic in uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy also. You are uh, not that point also because the uh, distal muscle, that means distal muscles are spared. So you get a pro, uh, proximal uh, reflux, that is the knee jerk will be sluggish, but angle jerk will be present. But in a spinal muscular atrophy, being a uh, generalized disease, universal hyporeflexia will be seen. So that is the very easy way to differentiate a spinal muscular atrophy or anti cell disease from a muscle disease. So that way you can easily clinically differentiate. The other aspect, because investigation aspect already um, uh, Dr. Vaishnavi has uh, given it, because I, I am not going to repeat thing. Only, pro only point is that we always, whenever we get a suspected muscle disease, we will ask for a uh, CPK. And if it is very much raised, means uh, uh, thousands or 10,000, then you know that it will be a dystrophies. But uh, in other diseases like inflammatory myopathies, you will get definitely thousands or above 500, you will get it. But when you remember that congenital myopathies, uh, many a times only marginal increase or uh, sometimes it may not be even increased because there is not much muscle destruction is not much. So you may have to use the other clues. That is why you differentiate uh, this thing. Then I think uh, since uh, uh, she has uh, mentioned, uh, we must remember certain kind because I know that uh, most of the uh, uh, pediatric population may not be diagnosing an individual uh, uh, muscle uh, disorder. And uh, I've seen that many are, uh, I, I know that everybody is aware, but uh, usually we may be diagnosing only conditions like uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy or a dermatomyositis. Other than, but to uh, remember, I am just uh, giving again, uh, these are uh, PG tips where you can remember for congenital myopathies, you remember the terminology that is congenital myopathy, that is CM. And uh, so CN, so just remember CM, CN. And so for uh, conditions you can remember, they are congenital um, um, muscle fiber type disproportion, central core disease, then uh, uh, that, that is uh, one first C is uh, congenital muscle fiber type disproportion. Then CM, CM would be uh, 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 myotubular myopathy or it is otherwise called as centronuclear myopathy nowadays. 
myo tubular myopathy and next C would be central core disease and N, CMCN, N is nemaline myopathy. So these are the four important myopathies that you have to remember and ideally they are diagnosed by muscle biopsy only because congenital muscle fiber disproportion, you get a type 1, type 2 disproportion. Uh, in uh, myotubular myopathy, the myotubular like appearance or a central nucleations will be there. And uh, in a, again, a central core disease, central cores are demonstrated and nemaline myopathy, you know that nemaline rods are demonstrated in the biopsy. So here again, earlier we were uh, um, uh, relying on uh, uh, muscle biopsy. So uh, definitely muscle biopsy will help in being an invasive procedure. Nowadays, we will straight away after if you are suspected a by muscle uh, disorder, after the preliminary initiation of the blood uh, uh, investigation to confirm it, usually we go for a clinical exome sequencing. That is a usual pattern nowadays, even though when you are in a, in a, in a PG uh, discussion, in an exam point of view, the student have to narrate them in a systematic manner with the muscle biopsy, etc. But again, clinically, we'll be going for the clinical exome sequencing where I will look for the specific, for example, myotubular myopathy, so MTM mutation you can look, look for like that uh, each one you may specify and uh, there are panels either for a clinical exome sequencing or a whole genome se whole exome sequencing or you can have a muscular or a myopathy panel where uh, they will be looking for this uh, panel of uh, uh, disorders and uh, then uh, one more point uh, to remember in mitochondrial biopathies because when we are suspecting uh, a second sire so then the uh, disorders, other uh, uh, disorders to be remembered are in this group would be uh, metabolic myopathies. There again, you remember that metabolic disorders means there can be lipid sore disorders, there can be glycogen sore disorders. This, uh, and uh, so lipid sore disorders, lipid uh, uh, myopathies, where the carnitin, uh, carnitin myopathy or a carnitin palmitate transferase deficiency. So they, they can be uh, diagnosed uh, by Again, uh, uh, TMS uh, testing where again uh, carnitine uh, levels can be identified. And then uh, uh, the other uh, muscular dystrophies, there again, muscular dystrophies uh, you classify according to the uh, uh, inheritance pattern. For example, uh, X linked disorders, autosomal recessive disorders, dominant disorders like that. So, in then uh, that, uh, as I have already I told you, the dystrophies there may be a specific muscle grouping involvement that you have to remember because congenital myopathy is to be differentiated by from the muscle muscular dystrophy by the uh, muscle grouping as we know that we know that in a duchenne muscular dystrophy it is uh, certain muscles are predominantly affected we all know calf muscle hypertrophy uh, deltoid muscle hypertrophy then the um, uh, brachioradialis hypertrophy. These are hypertrophic muscles. There will be involvement of the uh, uh, quadriceps muscles wasting, uh, iliotibial uh, wasting, similarly upper limb uh, biceps involvement. Like that, uh, uh, predominant uh, grouping of muscle involvement will be there. By that, it's so you have differentiated duchenne muscular dystrophy, then limb girdle muscular dystrophy, facial scapular humeral, there are spatial muscles, scapular and humeral muscles are affected like that. Even in a only, only one condition where you have to remember uh, with a distal muscle involvement would be myotonic dystrophy. Myotonic dystrophy, there will be distal muscle involvement will be there. There are uh, 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 but again, you know, there are uh, proximal weakness will be there, plus the hatchet facies will give you the diagnosis. But again, congenit is myotonic dystrophy. You have to remember that it can present at uh, birth, where uh, in a presenting as a floppy baby or a, uh, a baby who has difficulty in uh, uh, sustaining uh, breathing after delivery with the floppiness. There, the diagnosis is not by examining the child, but you have to examine the mother. So when the mother is having um, myotonic dystrophy, the baby will, uh, there can be a congenital myotonic dystrophy. That point you remember. So examine the mother for making a diagnosis of congenital myotonic uh, dystrophy. So uh, then other uh, muscular dystrophies uh, would be uh, that occur in children 
would be the uh, other autosomal recessive variants, that is the sacro sarcoglycanopathies. Just like uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, if it occurs in a male child, if a similar manifestation in a girl child, you can think of a uh, autosomal recessive form of a sarcoglycanopathy or a autos severe childhood uh, uh, autosomal recessive muscular dystrophy. That is one condition to be remembered. And then uh, two more conditions which may be in between the myopathies and muscular dystrophy would be the Ulrich muscular dystrophy and Bethlehem myopathy. Where again, you remember that Ulrich muscular dystrophy, there will be distal laxity. This is uh, not a rare condition in our uh, population because I have seen number of Ulrich muscular dystrophies where uh, the distal muscle, distal muscle, uh, la laxity and proximal muscle contractures, joint contractures with the, with the proximal muscle weakness and uh, easily a genetic study can be, diagnosis can be done by mutation analysis for a called six mutation, collagen uh, six uh, mutation. So that way we can make a diagnosis of Bullrich muscular uh, dystrophy also. And uh, uh, other, uh, already I was mentioning about the, uh, then coming to the mitochondrial uh, group of muscles. Classically, we have the Kern-Sire syndrome, where uh, the ptosis, progressive of thalmoplegia would be the manifestation with uh, a cardiac manifestation, cardiac conduction block may be there. They may have deafness and short stature. That is another uh, manifestation to be. There. And for diagnosis of a mitochondrial myopathy, if you are going to a muscle biopsy, specifically ask for a, a, a modified MGT stain, that is modified Gomori trichrome stain, MGT stain. This will give the characteristic uh, ragged red appearance because when normally when the MGT, that is mod, uh, Gomori trichrome is stained, there will be greenish color will be there to the uh, muscle. But uh, when the ragged uh, fibers, that is mitochondrial disorders, this fiber, uh, the color, the, the islands of uh, ragged red fibers will be seen. This is one of the very, very uh, um, uh, the color, colorful uh, findings in uh, muscle pathology. And uh, then for other mitochondrial uh, myopathies, we may have to go for an electron microscopy, for example, uh, megaconial uh, myopathy like that, where again, a mitochondrial uh, uh, di uh, disorders can be diagnosed by an electron microscope. Before that, we used to send the specimen to uh, Nimhans. Again, when you are uh, sending the specimen to Nimhans for a mitochondrial biopathy, you you can keep, uh, instead of keeping the muscle, uh, I think that aspect also could have been involved. I, I, I also forgot about that. That is when you are sending the muscle for a muscle biopsy, uh, if possible, we can add that also into the PG tip because uh, usually a formalin uh, uh, preserved uh, specimen is not used because you know that uh, for uh, this one, you have to keep the glutaraldehyde. Glutaraldehyde is available in our uh, hospitals from the uh, uh, theater. We can collect it because the, uh, uh, I think it is the SEDEX. Um, that is containing a glutaraldehyde and we, use, we were taking that. And uh, glutaraldehyde to be used for uh, uh, keeping the muscle for muscle uh, uh, mitochondrial cytopathy. And then uh, for a, um, uh, for a uh, glycogen storage disease, for example, when you suspect the Pombe's disease. Again, one more point to uh, just uh, for your information, for Pombe's disease, we have a Free, no, uh, the free uh, enzyme uh, estimation program by the Sanofi Genzyme. So you can uh, ask for that uh, uh, kit. And uh, from there, uh, the uh, uh, specimen can be sent. So it will be done uh, free, of course. And if uh, uh, that um, uh, Pombe's disease enzyme deficiency is detected, then they, they will do a genetic study also free of cost uh, for that. That also. I think all of you can remember. I think uh, I, I have taken a long time, so I'll uh, stop. Any other uh, questions or any discussions, I'll uh, answer. Uh, or other, uh, others, uh, uh, Shankar and others can contribute. Uh, thank you, sir. sir. Extensive clinical approach of uh, muscle disease. Any, any, any doubts or clarification anybody want to ask? You can ask by raising your hand. 
but you can put in the chat box. Both is acceptable. Or we will go to the next presentation and you can put the question in the chat box. Sir will answer or I will answer. Okay, so we, we, with a bit of time, we will go to the next presentation. Any doubts anybody is having, please, uh, please write it in the chat box. So from uh, Kalpana, Dr. Kalpana, please. Kalpana wants to tell something. Kalpana? Kalpana, you can unmute yourself and please talk. Kalpana, please unmute yourself. Kalpana, I put the microphone is switched off. Your microphone is switched off, Kalpana. Kalpana, mute down. Okay, we will come back after some time. So now we will go to the next uh, topic. Dr. Adarsh, Adarsh will present on uh, microarray and NGS, which already we have discussed during this talk. Uh, Sir discussed about the clinical exome and uh, various types of genetic panels. So I think next presentation, Dr. Adarsh will tell something about in a simpler way as far as possible. And any doubts are there, we will try to clarify. Others, you go ahead. The discussion, we can do it later. Okay, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yes, audible, audible. Okay. Uh, good evening, all. Today, for the next 20 25 minutes, we are going to discuss about two topics that is microarray technology and regarding the next generation sequencing. Both are advanced sensitive genetic test techniques. So, uh, first of all, what is a genetic testing? So, it is the analysis of a human DNA in any of its forms or related products. That is, uh, DNA, the human DNA or the human genetic material can be in the form of a chromosome, can be in the form of an RNA or a DNA or uh, proteins to detect the genetic causes, to detect the disease causing these variations. So, different types of genetic testings are there. That is, uh, the cytogenetics, that is, uh, that is seen in the first image. Um, so this is the cytogenetics that are mainly dealing with the chromosomes and then comes the molecular genetics that mainly deals with the DNA and then comes the biochemical genetics that is mainly deals with the that mainly deals with the proteins that is the products of DNA. So these are the three uh, different broad classification of genetic testing and under these uh, each of these headings there are multiple studies are there that is uh, under the cytogenetic testings there can be karyotyping, chromosomal microarray, fish technique is also there. And under the uh, heading of molecular diagnosis, a uh, molecular test, there are many other tests like RFIP, MLPA, Sangle sequencing, uh, whole gen, uh, then comes the NGS. So among these, uh, one of the two, uh, two of these important techniques are this chromosomal microarray and the next generation sequencing. So this is another image showing the uh, uh, different types of genetic testing based on their resolution. So these are the structural chromosomal aberrations that can be detected by a karyotyping. Aneuploidy can also be detected by a karyotyping. But the copy number variations that uh, those in, uh, abnormalities cannot be detected by, a detected by a karyotyping. So then we need another test. So these are the importance of these uh, higher order tests. So first of all, what is a microarray? So if this is the case when we see a genetic material using karyotyping and uh, with a resolution of 5 to 10 MP. Okay. So then this, this will be the case when we see it by a chromosomal microarray with the resolution of uh, 50 kb to 100 kb. So if we can see SAT hospital in, like this in a karyotyping, we can see it like this in a my, chromosomal microarray. So that's the basic difference between the karyotyping and microarray. Mainly deals, uh, the difference is there in the resolution of these two tests. 
So what is a microarray? It is the orderly arrangement of DNA fragments representing the genes of an organism on a small surface, usually a glass slide or a silicone or a nylon membrane. So it is usually referred to as a chip and it also requires some specialized robotics and imaging equipments for the final result. So just arranging the uh, DNA fragments in a uh, small surface on a small surface, that is the micro, micro array. So it has got an excellent association and linkage um, studies to uncover the chromosomal areas linked to a certain disease. And it can be viewed as an extension of fluorescence microscopic application in cellular biology. It also deals in, uh, with the, uh, it also uh, works via fluorescence microscopy and a development of molecular biology hybridization techniques. So it, mainly two words we should remember that is basically the fluorescence microscopy and the hybridization. These two are the two words in, two key words in micro. So uh, first of all, Uh, before start knowing about microarray, we should know about two other terms that is CNPs and SNPs. So CNPs are uh, pardon, actually slides move in a little second. മൈക്രോസോമൽ So it is a segment of DNA, which is 1 KB or more, that is very small in size and has a variable copy number that is compared to a standard uh, reference genome, it has, it will be having some extra chromosome or some less chromosome. So that's an abnormality. So that's the copy number variant. So the basic purpose of microarray is to detect these copy number variants. That's a one purpose. And the next terminology is the SNP, that is single nucleotide polymorphism. It's a C DNA sequence variation that occurs when a single nucleotide in the genome sequences are altered. That is uh, more minute than this copy number variant, but it is the most common type of genetic variation that is seen in the power population. So these two can be detected via microarray. That's the main advantage of this or the purpose of this microarray. So these chromosomal microarrays are designed to identify these copy number variants and the single nucleated polymorphisms, thereby detecting the chromosomal anomalies. So these anomalies like micro deletions, mosaicisms, uniparental disomy, triploidy, and regions of homozygosity. These all can be detected via chromosomal microarrays. So what's the basic principle and design of microarray? So the basic principle is just this sentence, that is chromosomal microarray is based on the complementary hybridization of nucleotides in the probe and target DNA. We'll come, uh, come on what is probe and what is a target. So it is basically a complementary hybridization of the nucleotides. So these are the components of microarray. First, the, uh, what's a probe? It's an, uh, the array which contains immobilized oligonucleotides. These oligonucleotides are the probes. So that's the first component of microarray, the array itself. So this is an array and it will be having an, a probe that is already uh, uh, that is already uh, fixed, in, fixed there in the array. So they are immobilized. And one or more label samples or targets that are hybridized with the microarray. That's a target. So this is a probe and the uh, sample we are uh, giving to the micro, we are putting on the microarray are the targets. And the next one is the detection system that detects the hybridization signal. So uh, these are the three components, the probes, the targets, and the detection system. These are the components of microarray. So what's the procedure of microarray? So various kinds of microarrays are made up of various molecules, including oligonucleotides, 
complementary DNAs, clones, PCR products, polypeptides, and antibodies. So these uh, this probe can be any of these. The probe that we have already mentioned can be any of these. Can be oligonuclear, can be a cDNA, clones, or PCR products. And a microarray works by exploiting the ability of a given mRNA molecule to hybridize specifically to the DNA template from which it is originated. And as micro mRNA is easily degraded, it is changed into a stable cDNA form with the, uh, some fluorochrome dyes like CY3 and CY7, CY5. And these are used to label these complementary DNAs. And uh, once they hybridize, it will show the fluorescence color. So that will come later. So a specific location is assigned to each DNA fragment representing a gene on the microarray. And the robotic spotters are used to set thousands of spots on a single slide. And these spots themselves can be oligonucleotides, complement DNA, or DNA. So these are the probes. And the samples uh, fluorescently labeled DNA or RNA. These are the targets. And will hybridize with the RA's complementary sport, uh, spots. That's the probes. And the remaining uh, DNA fragments will be washed away. So only the hybridized props and targets will be there in the at the end of our procedure. So by exposing microarray to a scan, then we'll expose this microarray to a scanner and uh, luminous spots on the array that represent the hybridized DNA can be detected. So together, the camera and microscope produce a digital image of the array. And a computer application is used to generate a table with the ratios red to green fluorescence intensity for each area of the array and DNA identification. So this image basically concludes our microarray. That is, uh, these are the unlabeled RNA or DNA. And uh, they can be labeled with, uh, using different fluorescent dyes. So these are the uh, green ones and the red ones. So these are the labeled targets. And uh, this is the microarray. This is the uh, simple solid surface of that chip. And in that, on that chip, uh, we'll fabricate that chip with probes. That is, they can be complementary DNA, can be oligonucleotides. So complementary DNA means these DNAs will be complementary to these RNA, uh, RNA substances. Okay, so uh, these target, label target will be allowed to hybridize with this microarray where there are multiple probes are there. And then there will be the hybridization. And if the, some of the genes are not, or DNA particle fragments are not hybridized, they will be washed away. And then we will subject it to some uh, microscopic examination and the data analysis using sophisticated machines. So these are the two types of, there are two types of microarray. One is the comparative genome hybridization array, otherwise known as RACGH. So in this RACGH, uh, this is the DNA of the patient, and it's the control DNA, that is the ideal DNA. Then they will be allowed to hybridize. Next time they will be hybridized. So in the array, we can see this color, that is uh, this green and um, red will be there, along with there will be normal color, that is yellow color will be there. So if green is predominating, then we'll suspect some gain of function mutations. And if, um, or some gain of chrom extra chromosome material is then our patient DNA. And if this uh, loss, that is if red color is seen, then we'll suspecting some do uh, deletion. We will su we'll suspect the micro deletions in our uh, DNA of our patient. So uh, these are the yellow is the normal expected one. A uh, ratio will balance between this green and red. Okay. So then we will subject it to a computer analysis, and then we can uh, using the statistical softwares we can see this gain of function or this gain of some genetic material in that part of the chromosome and some deletion of chromosomal material also. And this is another type of microarray that is SNP array. SNP you have already seen single nucleated polymorphism. In that case, we'll uh, label the patient DNA and then we'll allow to hybridize. And uh, the patient DNA will be having uh, two alleles, that is allele A and allele B. And if there is a deletion, uh, if it is normal. Uh, so if there is. Sir, uh, after hybridization, uh, the result will be like this. That is, if it is uh, both alleles of A are present, then the color will be like this green color. And if A and B are present, then uh, a light green in A and a light green in B. And if no A, only B is there, two copies are B, then it is like uh, dark green in the B. And if one of the A is absent, that is, then there will be a single light green in the allele A portion, and if B, one allele of B is absent, then we will light green color in the B portion. Sim uh, similarly, the rest of the results will be there. 
So this is another kind of microarray technique. One is CGHRA and there is SNPR. Uh, so this uh, diagram concludes our microarray. That is uh, why after getting this microarray, we will subject to some fluorescent detection via sophisticated machines. And this image acquisition and analysis will be done. And then there will be data analysis and visualization of different chromosomes. And uh, finally, the end product will be there and we will interpret the study. So what about the applications of this microsomal chromosomal array? So uh, the highest, it has got the highest diagnostic yield for any single test in evaluating the cognitive impairment, developmental delay, multiple malformation of an unknown etiology. And for autism spectrum disorder also, the first line investigation will be, nowadays it is chromosomal, microsomal array. So microarray. So first line investigation for antenatally detected structural abnormalities, still birth or intrauterine demise, and when a karyotype shows an extra chromosome material of unknown origin. In all these conditions also, we'll uh, look for by chromosomal uh, microarray technique. And also it can identify loss, gain or loss of chromosomal material in up to 20% of individuals then apparently balanced chromosomal translocation. So these are the major applications of microarray. So uh, the one thing we have to remember is it is the first line investigation of choice for autism spectrum disorders and for uh, multiple malformations of some unknown etiology. So it can identify diseases occurring due to medium and large gene deletions or duplications. It also helps in identification of biomarkers, target genes for tumor suppressor, genes with prognostic importance and classification of tumors. Uh, so this is some uh, one case, one child with multiple malformations and this uh, child is subjected for microarray and the result was like this. So here we can see uh, one side it is uh, um, in all the genomes, the one half of the uh, microsomal chromosomal array, it has got some uh, deficiency. So that indicates some deletion. So it has got a 7.242 MP deletion at uh, chromosome uh, 21. So 7Q21.2 Q22 deletion. That was the abnormality with this child, and that was detected by cytosine or the chromosomal microarray. So that regarding the advantages of microarray. So chromosomal microarray can be done from DNA isolated from any type of tissue, unlike karyotyping, which requires live and actively invading cells. So it can be uh, detected from any kind of tissue. And it has got a higher resolution that we already mentioned. And it has got objective result interpretation and can detect the cryptic imbalances in chromosomes in apparently balanced karyotype. So the limitations of microsomal array, it does not detect the balanced translocations that do not alter the chromosome uh, copy number variants. Microsomal, microsomal, microsomal array can only detect the variations with the copy number variants and the SNPs. So if there is some other balanced translocation that do not alter the CND, then it cannot be detected. And also they, it has got an inability to detect point mutations or um, deletions or duplication at the single gene level. Can detect micro deletions, but cannot detect a uh, deletion or a duplication at a single gene level. So it does not detect low level mosaicism and polyploidy. And also missing of variations in regions that are not targeted by the props in the targeted arrays. It has also got a difficulty in interpretation of this variance of unknown significance. So these are the advantages and disadvantages of microarray. Now we move on to the next generation sequencing. It was already mentioned it is a molecular diagnostic technique. So this one we have seen uh, this, if suppose this is the karyotyping. And if this is the uh, microsome, chromosomal microarray, then this will be the next generation sequencing. So uh, that's the resolution of next generation sequencing. So it is a DNA sequencing technology that uses parallel sequencing of multiple small DNA fragments to determine the sequence. So in next generation sequencing, we are uh, parallelly using multiple DNA fragments. So it has got a very uh, efficiency in regarding the time of results. So this technology has allowed a dramatic increase in the speed and decrease in cost and emerged as the most powerful tool for the diagnosis of monogenic disorders. So basically what's the technique behind this next generation sequencing? So the starting material, it is a DNA extracted from the leukocytes in the whole blood is used for the clinical, most clinical cell testing. And for patients who have undergone hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, hair follicles are likely to be the most reliable source. And we have to take the sample in an EDTA bottle also. So the amplification and library preparation is the next step. 
So prior to NGS or the next generation sequencing, this starting DNA material must be amplified in order to execute the sequencing process. So for amplification, we are using PCR-based techniques to replicate the patient DNA. So after replication and amplification, then comes the sequencing. So NGS provides several sequencing approaches, which includes whole genome sequencing, that is WGS, or whole exome sequencing, clinical exome sequencing, targeted gene panels. These are different uh, sequencing approaches we use in NGS. So this is the basic step. This is the this image concludes our NGS. So this, these are the exomes, introns, exomes, the coding regions, and introns, the non-coding regions. And this is the gene A. This is the intergenic non-coding region. And this is gene B, where there are exomes, introns, exomes, introns are there. Then we under, uh, we make them fragment and we make them denaturate. So these are the denaturated fragments of this DNA. And then according to our approach of sequencing, we consider uh, whether to take the introns, extrons, or both. So in whole genome, we take all of them. That is the exons, the introns, the intercoding, non -coding, intergenic non-coding regions also. So that's the point in whole genome. And in exome study, we capture all exons and exon intron boundaries. So that's the, uh, the, so they are known as exons. So this is the whole exome sequencing. And then the uh, gene targeted panel, that is capture of coding region of genes of interest. So, so in this case, we'll only take those uh, exons from gene B. Here uh, um, means here we are uh, in the exome sequencing. We are uh, we have taken the exomes from the coding regions from gene A, both gene A and both gene B. But in this case, targeted panel will only consider exons from uh, this gene B only. So that's the targeted panel. So these are the basic three approaches: whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, and the targeted gene panel sequence. So then we we'll, uh, make them sequence, and the next step is mapping and alignment against the reference genome. So we'll keep a reference genome. This is the reference sequence. And these are the patient sequences. So there are multiple number of patient sequences are there. So these are the patient sequences. So next step is uh, the variant calling. Variant calling is nothing but the identifying the nucleated sequence variants in the patient DNA when compared to reference you know, uh, human genome sequence. So there will be some variations. So identifying those variations makes the step variant coding. Identifying what are the variations from sub our subject's DNA to the reference sequence. That's the variant coding. And the next step is variant filter. So identifying the variant that is responsible for the phenotype. So there will be multiple number of variations between a human genome or our patient sequence and the reference sequence. But uh, what are things are needed for us? So that's a variant filter. So after identifying the variant variations via variant calling, then we do variant filtering in which we'll identify the variant that is responsible for the phenotype of our patient. So that's the point of this variant calling and variant filtering. And then according to the clinical condition, we'll report the case. So report the disease causing variant to the patient or the clinician or no variant that explains the patient phenotype is identified. That's the final conclusion. So the, the reporting and the interpretation of this next generation sequencing that is according to American College of Medical Genetics and American Molecular uh, Pathology Standards and Guidelines, uh, there will be five classification that is benign, likely benign, variant of unknown significance, likely pathogenic and pathogenic. So benign means strong and conclusive evidence against the pathogenicity. And uh, likely benign means strong but limited evidence against the pathogenicity. And the likely pathogenic means strong but limited evidence of pathogenicity. And pathogenic means strong and conclusive evidence of pathogenicity. So we'll be having some doubt that uh, how can we know whether it is benign or whether it is pathogenic or whether it is VUS. So there are certain guidelines for, put forward by this ACMG. And after seeing the guidelines and the criteria, then they, it is uh, whether it is benign or like Ah, okay, so muted. I muted. Sure. So now, uh, so 
So that's the path, the first one, the pathogenic. That is variants previously report reported in patients with or strongly suspect of being pathogenic based on the preclinical studies. That's the pathogenic variant. The likely pathogenic means those with sequence features that are likely to be implicated in disease pathogenesis, but for which conclusive evidence of pathogenesis is not available. That's the likely pathogenic. The likely benign means those for which weak data in the medical literature supporting the pathogenicity may be available, but for which the majority of evidence suggests that the effect of variant is benign. And benign means genetic variants are not predicted to alter the gene expression or function. So the key thing is the unknown si clinical significance or the uncertain clinical significance. That's the BUS. That's the uh, problem for us. So this BUS means variants that have some features, suggestive of possible co functional consequence, but for which there is insufficient evidence of either a pathologic or pathogenic or benign role. So that's the confusion. So it has got some possible functional consequence, but we don't have the enough evidence to say whether it is pathogenic or benign. So in that case, what, uh, what will you do? So the variants can only be interpreted after a good, good clinical history. Then we have to retrospectively take once more a clinical history, then the family history and the physical examination has to be performed once again. So then after clinicians reviewing this NGS report should apply critical thinking. That is whether these phenotypes can be pathogenic or benign or this uh, genetic uh, report whether to take it seriously as pathogenic or uh, can neglect it as a benign condition. So then uh, they'll again critically think about this NGS report and extensively review the medical literature. And uh, any similar cases are there with these kind of presentations and this gene causing this condition and consult with the experts with the experts in genomic analysis. Then only we can decide on this BUS conditions, that is variance of uncertain significance. So that, uh, that's all about the reporting and interpretation of NGS. Now about the consent and counseling. So informed consent is essential before NGS-based testing. And the pre-test counseling is essential to explain the yield, utility, and implications of a negative or positive report for the family. And even if we are doing a whole exome sequencing, only 85 to 92 percent of the exomes are known to us or sequenced or genes are sequenced. That is some 19,300 genes are there and out of which only 85 to 92 percent of genes are sequenced and there only that much data is available to us. So there are certain 8 to 15 percent of uh, rest of the data that we are not aware. So we don't know whether the uh, negative report means whether it is truly negative or we are missing something. So we should have a counseling regarding this also before doing the test. And an important ethical consideration is the reporting of incidental findings. That means uh, we have uh, done a genetic testing to report uh, to uh, uh, to find out some condition for some glycogen storage glycogen storage disorder. But incidentally, we have detected some. Uh, BRCA1 mutations that can lead to breast cancer in later life. So that time will be uh, we should consider regarding the ethical consideration. So we have come with some phenotype and we have detected that phenotype and we have detected some other phenotype which can must manifest later. So in that case also uh, there should be some ethical consideration whether to whether disclose this thing or how to counsel these patients. And the counseling of patients is so important so that only wanted results are reported back to the patient. So according to the patient, we should report these uh, reports. So the indications of NGS include targeted panel testing can be done when a particular phenotype is caused by variations in more than one gene, that is locus heterogeneity, and WES, that is whole exome sequencing, can be performed in patients with genetically heterogeneous monogenic disorders when targeted panel testing fails. And the whole genomic sequencing may be considered when the exome sequencing fails to identify a disease causing variant. So these are the indications for exome and genome sequencing. If some targeted gene panel, we are suspecting some strong condition, then we can uh, straight away do the targeted uh, panel testing. Uh, for example, in case of osteogenesis imperfecta, there are some 20 genes causing this osteogenesis imperfecta. Uh, some gene may be normal, some gene may be affected in our patient. So if you do a Sanger sequencing in all of these 20 genes, then it will be um, a Sanger sequencing usually uh, used to detect some single gene abnormality. And if we do a Sanger sequencing in this patient, we have to do 20 different Sanger sequence to uh, find the ultimate cause. It will be uh, 20 times costly than that single whole exome sequencing. So this whole exome sequencing helps in uh, diminishing the cost of these all investigations. And these are the advantages and disadvantages regarding the uh, NGS. That is simultaneously can simultaneously advantages. It can simultaneously sequencing more than hundred genes and whole genomes. That's what we uh, just uh, now mentioned. 
and the rapid sequencing of large genomic region and it can analyze single gene or multi gene panels enriched for disease specific genes of interest and it require less input of dna or rna that is in case of nanograms and the growing number of data and many newly discovered genes or genes or variants are discovered using ngs and it is cost effective and it has got a higher reproducibility so these are the advantages of ngs whereas the disadvantages include it has got some technical limitations that is um sequence it can only uh, sequence the g series regions repetitive uh, deficiency in sequencing the g series regions repetitive sequences for fragmented genes and duplicated regions or sequences that uh, share the high homology with other genes or pseudo genes so means this basically this ngs cannot detect some uh, small uh, deletions in single gene mutations so that the, those are the problems with this means duplication or some monosomy or triploidy so these things that we have mentioned the chromosomal microarray those things cannot be detected in ngs that's a disadvantage with this so in those condition we should combine the ngs with some other genetic study uh, so in case of sma we have to do some uh, mlpa and then we have uh, then we have to consider the ngs and in case of duchenne muscular dystrophy also initially we have to do the mlpa and if some abnormalities are fine then uh, we'll consider doing mgs so combination of genetic test may be needed in those conditions to uh, tackle the disadvantages or demerits of or deficiencies of these two genetic tests and the difficult data interpretation and classification and there will be a plethora of vus need validation to n number of vus will be there so uh, getting validation for or is a tedious task to uh, getting validation for all these vus conditions and the challenge for clinical use in non actionable variants or vus that is the condition is not harmful to the patient then whether to treat or not that's the next problem and the new mutations in rare disorders with the no therapeutic support will be detected by ngs but then we will be clueless to how to treat these patients so those are the disadvantages with ngs so that's all about the chromosomal uh, microarray technique and the next generation sequence thank you for uh, stop share your slides and uh, on the sir uh hello uh, uh, dr habers has uh, uh, discussed the topic uh, in, uh, in a very excellent manner congratulations others uh, so uh, this uh, chromosomal microarray and uh, uh, ngs these are uh, relatively newer uh, genetic testings and uh, the frequency of doing such tests has uh, increased for over the last 10 years and also the cost of these testing has uh, decreased markedly so now uh, most many clinicians have started using this uh, and the thing is uh, uh, it is very important to know in which on the not audible on the entire order uh, the ngs in each and every situation uh, because it gives a clearer picture but it is not like that uh, where a karyotyping is indicated the ngs will not serve the purpose so uh, a clinician should be knowing in which all situations which test to be ordered and another important thing uh, other shares also mentioned is regarding counseling because many of these genetic tests are costly and uh, many a time you may not get the uh, expected result also uh, here other shares mentioned that all the genes are not covered as a whole genome sequence we usually use only for research purpose and for clinical purpose usually we go for uh, clinical exome or whole exome uh, so the if you are suspecting a particular condition you may the, after the testing you may not identify the exact uh, diagnosis so that has uh, has to be counseled uh, before testing and another thing is uh, uh, giving uh, required clinical data because uh, uh, after doing this uh, investigation the 
the geneticist or the lab person uh, will get so so many uh, data which may not be relevant to that clinical situation so he can filter uh, the uh, variations he is detecting if we are give, providing enough clinical details so we should be giving important points in the history a, a very good pedigree and also uh, the what are the clinical findings and also what all investigations has already done and what are abnormalities we have already discussed. If we provide uh, all this data, then the lab people can help us in uh, uh, getting the exact diagnosis in a better way. Uh, so these are all uh, some of the points which I wanted to mention. Uh, the rest of the things, uh, you can have questions and uh, myself or Dr. Shankar will be answering. Thank you. Any question? Is there anybody can ask or put into the chat box? Uh, Parvati Madam, Parvati Madam is there? Madam, comments? Madam, unmute you, Madam, unmute you. Unmute your bed in the lay. Yeah, host and you can let Larry Oh. It was a nice uh, presentation, both uh, pieces. And um, these are all new to me, so I may not be able to uh, have any opinion on these things. So it was a nice experience anyway. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Shija. Uh, Under the conditions with the polygenic inheritance like... Uh, DM, I think diabetes mellitus has NGS any use. Mondas, you want to answer or? Uh, Shankar, you can answer. Sir. Okay. So actually in polygenic disorders, NGS have not much role. Not much role means in the clinician's perspective, there is not much role because NGS is a platform. So a routine clinical exome or a whole exome will not identify any single gene because it is having a, already this uh, question person has asked polygenic. So multiple genes will be there. So you can identify multiple genes. In the same diabetes mellitus, if you are suspecting maturity onset diabetes, it's a single gene disorder, you can do NGS. But in actual polygenic disorders, there are two options are there. One is you can do a genome-wide association studies to identify the various locus. Then we have to go to the candidate genes. Or you can do NGS, but you will get multiple polymorphic variants you will get. Then you have to do some bioinformatic analysis or some protein function studies. So for the research purpose, it can be used. For a single clinician's purpose, for diabetes mellitus, NGS is to do only for the MODI, that is maturity onset diabetes, which is a monogenic diabetes. Monogenic diabetes, it can be used. Another question Kalpana has asked, that is need for parental testing. In VUS. I'm on the mm -hmm. Parental testing, Kalpana has asked. Uh, hello, am I audible? Yes, 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 uh, In some cases, we will get a variant of unknown significance. So uh, we may be in a dilemma whether that uh, uh, abnormality has to be given importance or not. In such cases, uh, what we usually advise is to test the affected and unaffected individuals uh, in the family. So if the same variant of uh, unknown significance is there in an unaffected member, 
uh, then we know that uh, that uh, uh, abnormality is not significant. So like that, you can uh, it will be helpful in deciding uh, whether the VUS has to be given significance or not. Uh, Uh, that correct. That's called uh, that. You should, we will call it the segregation analysis. So he has told about the VUS, how we can uh, VUS can be changed to a pathogenic or something. There are two options, two three pipelines are there. One is the segregation analysis, as Mond has rightly pointed out, affected members and non-affected members. But in multiple members in a family, it may be practically difficult. So sometimes we will use the parental blood as uh, they are affected or not affected. We will see not some dominant conditions, new mutations in the child. Even though in view, yes, it's not available, variation is not present in the parents. We will see that most probably it's a sporadic new mutation. This view, yes, can be taken as a can be taken as a significant variant. But based on that, we cannot do prenatal diagnosis. For a clinical purpose, we can consider this probably it is a significant variant. Kalpana, you want to tell something? Kalpana, madam, you can unmute and the previous uh, talk also you want to give some suggestions. Kalpana? Hello. Ah, uh, I was you... not able to unmute. That is the problem with this okay. disabled. And uh, okay. one more is actually this uh, regarding this genetic thing, parental testing, when the father, if, uh, parent is having the same mutation, some of them may be incomplete penetrance and all. Uh, it is sometimes very difficult to say when the child parent is also having the same mutation and he is not showing anything, then what can we do? Any other way by which we can say? No, no. That's I told because his VUS is very difficult to settle it out. So most of the time, as rightly pointed out, parent will have that variation. So as you rightly pointed out, it may be an incomplete penetrance. But if there is no enough reports to say there is incomplete penetrance, we can say that there is no sufficient evidence to say that the phenotype is linked to the variation. So we cannot prove that this is the cause, but it may or may not be the cause. But then we can use the other methods, like one is the clinical phenotype, how it is matching. Perfectly matching, other biomarkers are there, for example, in a metabolic disorder. Classically, it's fitting into MSUD, MRS features of MSUD, EMS showing MSUD, ECMS is showing features suggestive of some metabolic Everything is fitting. Only thing is we are getting a VUS. Then uh, same thing, you can consider that probably it may be pathogenic. And in autosomal recessive disorders and X-linked disease, this parental testing is absolutely you will not be useless because both the parents will have heterozygous state. And in X-linked disorders, mother always will have an heterozygous state. So this parental testing will not help you much. Only in very few situations, it will help you. And other methods are, one is bioinformatic analysis, how this protein uh, structuring and everything changing, or it's a new view. Yes, you can put into this site and uh, some other areas. Two, three people, same phenotype identifying this view. Yes, this view yes will change to a pathogenic variant. Then you can say that okay, okay, multiple members are having the same disease phenotype. Then probably so it is view yes is always a tricky situation. It is very difficult as a geneticist. We definitely follow, we will not do prenatal diagnosis with view yes for a clinical purpose. If you are feeling Probably it is the same disease you can consider because it doesn't make any uh, brandy in them, brandy, so you can do it. But for prenatal diagnosis, definitely VUS cannot, we can not go ahead with the prenatal diagnosis. Then uh, regarding this trinucleotide repeat also, just say something, whether in uh, any whole genome or anything can we get it without doing it separately? You, usually, usually in a basic standard teaching, the NGS, all exome, all nothing can detect trinucleotide repeat. Because here we are actually comparing the gene sequences. Only sequence variations can be identified. The lesions will be missed. Duplications will be missed. And similarly, trinucleotide repeat will be missed. But, but sometimes very small deletions sometimes can be identified in NGS. Newer NGS platforms can mm -hmm. identify some of the uh, uh, exonic deletions or something. But most of the time, the standard practice is deletions will be missed, duplications will be missed, and trinucleotide repeat will be missed. And actually, in trinucleotide repeat, you don't have to do the NGS. 
specifically you have to do the triple primed pcr tp pcr for the specific gen test has to be done so it is not recommended ngs but uh, there are some new ngs platforms uh, usually in research purpose where this specific type of this can be identified but routinely it will not pick up thank you actually i wanted to tell something regarding the previous uh, thing yes because, yes go ahead uh, go ahead kalpana madam uh, because the first thing is the laboratory diagnosis of muscle disorders rather than you can state as muscle weakness because muscle disorders means uh, you have to actually know that it is a muscle disorder because okay, anterior okay. one cell everything will come that is one second one is actually regarding the algorithm that is mentioned as either a constant or a progressive weakness that is actually two things constant means it is a fixed weakness or static weakness and the progressive is so that is mentioned i think a better thing is whether it is acute subacute or chronic and among the chronic it is remaining relatively static or slowly progressive and more rapidly progressive that will be one way and um, then there is cpk also there is some confusion regarding the things uh, because whenever we say that it is a muscular dystrophy there is actual destruction of the muscle fibers so the cpk will be very very high also in inflammatory myopathy because there is inflammation and destruction it will be high but in a congenital myopathy where this is a structural problem Uh, the, there is an increase in the apoptosis so it may be slightly raised only or it can even be normal so a congenital myopathy cannot be ruled out by a normal cpk that is one in between there is written like high high is also seen in congenital myopathy so many things have been written there there are certain mistakes there and uh, then another point is regarding emg and now conduction studies that uh, there should be something that should be added in the lab diagnosis and uh, that is not seen and the electrophysiology and uh, then one more is the regarding the muscle biopsy one point that is to be added is a muscle that is not very severely affected or a muscle who is not at all affected these two should not be taken as a muscle that is moderately affected should be selected that is another point uh, then or is metabolic metabolic myopathy is considered as synonymous with uh, becardel's disease that is not correct uh, even uh, hypothyroidism all endocrine problems hypocalcemia everything will come and uh, then regarding the periodic paralysis one point that was mentioned was uh, it, the, there will be hypokalemia there will be hypokalemia only at the time of patient is having the disease that is uh, only at the time of uh, weakness only it will be there and this periodic paralysis and all you can say it is recurrent short lasting like that so there are certain points which are a little uh, um, just be corrected that is what i wanted to tell otherwise both the presentations were very good actually thank you thank you thank you hmm. anybody wants to tell anything otherwise we'll go ahead with the Kem, Kem is there? Kem, can close. Yes, sir, close I am line. here. I am here. So Ranjit is there, or you can just tell the vote of thanks, and we will close. I think Ranjit is not there. Though. Okay. So that was uh, both the presentations are really good and informative. So I take this opportunity to thank each and everyone who has presented as well as who has contributed to the very good discussion, and I also thank uh, today's chief guest, Dr. Piyush Gupta, sir. and all our ods of iit kerala and central iit was participated in this finally i like to thank all the postgraduate students who have gone uh, who have participated uh, in this program and made it a huge success thank you so much thank you your sir krishna mohan thank you pandas thank you sir thank you sir and all the senior persons